Well, thank you for hosting me. I mean, that's a pleasure to talk at Lipotype. I mean, I'm watching the, the seminar series very closely, very enjoyable, I must say. And uh, well, let's see if if I will not let you disappoint, get disappointed right today. Okay. So I mean, the um, I mean, to, today I'll talk about tissues. So why tissues? You know, well, any tissues? Let's just take it broad. Will deserve a special attention. Well, let's step back a little bit and, and uh, uh, make a kind of you know, philosophical view on what the lipidome is. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, I mean, although people kind of understand this very well, but I mean, still, let, 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 let me just talk about this a little to be on the same page. I mean, the lipidome is not hardly uh, sort of a heavily encoded, right? There's a genome. So there's a reasonably straightforward, I'll put quotes, translation of a genome to the proteome. But there is not, no such thing like uh, translating the uh, submit, like in a proteome to, to a lipidome and metabolome. In fact, it's a kind of a community, community of molecules, which are built through the negotiation <laughs> of, of the available enzymes, which can synthesize lipids, degrade them, remodel, reshuffle, you know, transport, and whatever, and available resources. It's, you know, I used to say it's like European Union. Right. I mean, there are some compromises made, uh, some strict rules to follow and intent, but I mean, still, the lipidome that we measure, what we observe, is a compromise, is a product of negotiation of the available catalysis and available resources. Why it's important? I mean, it's important because um, it's difficult to say what is the standard lipidome and what is the, the baseline of that. And while measuring lipids is as difficult or as easy as measuring like any kind of type of biomolecules, the special, uh, the special clause on the lipidome is that um, there's no baseline, per se. So it has to be, uh, let me elaborate on this uh, a bit later and you will see that it requires certain special type of quantification, certain special type of Jewish philosophy, how to, to interpret data, and uh, some special analytical approach, which differs from what we used to apply for biomolecules, for small molecules, for also like including the you know, proteins, including you know, the wide spectrum of metabolites. And the lipidome in this sense is a special because again, it's not hard encoded. It's a product of the compromise between catalytic activities and available resources. Uh, we, uh, we've, and others, and you know, also like Lipotype, we've been developing the shotgun lipidomics for that. So as you know, I mean, there are two big approaches to analyze a pool of uh, complex biomolecules. One is, let's say, let's get separate by LC and then analyze them online, preferably or offline, if, if you wish. Another one is shotgun. Uh, what is a shotgun and uh, why we call it shotgun? The idea is the form. So we extract lipids from any kind of samples, from cells, tissues, organisms. But before extraction, we spike in some internal standards. So then we took the whole soup as we recover and infuse it into MS spectrometer. So direct analysis, no separation. So we use high resolution machines actually to, to snapshot the, uh, the, the composition. Although we have to keep in mind that the, the vast majority of signals that we detect are actually fake, right? I mean, they are, they are not real. Uh, they are not real signals uh, which we can attribute to, to, to the biomolecules. So we have to use special analytical approaches and software actually to sort right from wrong, to identify lipids and quantify lipids. And the software here plays, of course, the bigger role. So we use two types of softwares, one to, to clean up the spectrum, you know, like a big strainer in, in a lipid explorer, we should develop in our lab and on Lipotype has its Lipotype Explorer and software to identify and quantify lipids. So at this point, the product, I mean, let me maybe just get the, the pointer. Yes, I have it now. So the, at, the, at this point, the product is a Excel spreadsheet in a sense, right? So we have a catalog of lipids that we identified and their quantities. And that comes to statistical analysis. So, I mean, the important point is the following. To remember, A, we don't do the separation of lipids before the analysis. And B, we operate with, at this point, we operate with quantities, 
with smaller quantities. That's that's essential. That's what we come to this. So we don't reconsider the signals, the raw signals per se, but only interpretable signals A and the signals converted into the quantities P, right? This is what the shotgun is about. All right. That's one of our, our former colleagues now in Ludense. And we, with essential, the kind of, you know, he shows the essential message, essential for any, any kind of a shotgun interpretation. Why? Because we value the absolute values, if I'm allowed to say so. So, why absolute quantification? And what's the difference between relative and absolute? A relative quantification, where we quantify the abundance of certain molecules, the lipids, in many different conditions. We don't really know how much of the molecule is there. So the actual quantification is that we determine the concentration or abundance or a normalized concentration, but I mean, the, let's say the, uh, but it's always two, it's more moles. In this way, and that's what, what came to, to my sort of philosophical and maybe slightly extended introduction, is that we have to, when talking to lipidol, about lipidols, we have to determine the reference values because there's no baseline per se. We have to determine this artificially. So we, we have to set the, the biological variation. The same applies to metabolites, of course, but I mean, for lipidome, it's critical and of critical. So we have to compare the abundances of lipids, not between the biological states or experiment states or normal disease, but also between the, 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 the molecules, right? We have to compare a facet colines to ethanolamines, the ethanolamines to cholesterol and so on and so forth, right? Only in this sense, in, the, in a kind of the molar comparison, you can do the valid biological interpretation. So, I mean, we have two types of comparison. So each time we have to kind of go to the molar percent, in a sense, and get the molar composition of, of, the, uh, of, of the sample which we analyze. And then, of course, we compare sample to sample within projects. Last but not least, and may I say that at the current state of development, it's maybe the first, maybe I should have not started this, right? Because so many people are doing lipidomics in so many labs, and so the palette of technologies is so broad that the interlab consistency must become an issue. And this is difficult, right? Because it's, uh, uh, I mean, because again, we, we are talking about some promiscuous uh, constellation of biomolecules, the, the lipidome, you know, it's a compromised product in a sense, right? So in a sense, how do we know if we are measuring correct sort of composition or incorrect composition or biased composition? Because also the composition can be biased in certain classes. You can be correct in 20 and completely fail in 21st. So one of the ways to do this is to apply the molar concentrations because the molar concentrations, the molar quantities can be directly comparable between labs. They are not signals, they are not relative uh, intensities, they are not something which is, which is sort of transformed from the raw data, but that has the absolute, absolute concentrations have the absolute value, if I'm allowed to say so. Is it doable? Yes, it's doable. For example, one of the uh, just just you know I have many of those cases, but let me just just uh, um, highlight a few examples. One of the lipid classes uh, in plasma, uh, lysophosphate uh, two standards applied, 12, 0, 30, uh, 30, 0, and uh, we do it like in two time periods, you know, um, uh, within the two months. And then you see that the biological variation is rather small, and the technical variation is almost negligible. So it's doable. We have different standards, we have different time points, we have different machines, yet the concentrations are very much close. So it's kind of a doable, right? Keep in mind that in the y-axis, there are micromoles. We, uh, we talk about concentrations in the plasma in here. Doable. Big, big, big issue is, are we concordant with, uh, let's say, with clinical analysis? When you go to, to a doctor and then the doctor orders a blood test, there are four lipid primes, exactly four, uh, that, that actually shows the sort of a lipid uh, metabolism status. That's the cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and, and uh, total lipid. So, I mean, they measure a totally different principle compared to us. But since we are quantifying each lipid in moles, we can somehow simulate the analysis by the doctor. And it turns out that our simulation is reasonably correct. So there's some variations in here and there, but I mean, it's not dependent on abundance and they kind of still sounds reasonable, right? So compared to the doctors, which are giving you the integral parameters, which yeah, will have some medical value, but biochemically have limited sense, we quantify each and every molecule, right? And then produce this number for a doctor. 
So it's it's kind of a magic that concordance is there and so good, but it's doable. And then, of course, the big issue is interlaboratory comparison. I mean, we and others have been involved uh, a few years ago in the in a kind of ring trial. Uh, Pioneer and was conceptualized by John Bowden, so a fantastic paper, fantastic work. So he kind of uh, distributed the standard NIST uh, um, samples through, throughout many participants. People analyzed it separately. They made a table like this with the different uh, uh, different um, like labs and the techniques used. And it was, everything was completely blind, really blind. I mean, no leaks or whatever. So we don't know who is who and uh, we don't know. I mean, how all the techniques are apart from this very scarce description here. So we let's look at the the um, shotgun. So that two labs, one industrial as you see in here, uh, one in academia. Both use the direct infusion. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, the difference between shotgun and direct infusion is kind of mysterious. Let's call that that this definition is the same, right? And, and and both use the high resolution machines. We have no idea what the machines are anyway. So I mean, they're completely the, the same sample. Completely independent labs, independent methods. Maybe like extraction has similarity, but uh, uh, I mean different software, whatever. So I mean, what you see here is a is a concordance or discordance of the methods rather than hands. So I mean, let's just there was a fantastic supplementary report of the, those. Uh, here you have labs over here, numbers, ciphers, right? And here's the abundance. Again, everything is the molar concentration. And you see that the two sort of uh, high resolution shotgun labs are highly concordant for abundant lipid and for also much lower abundant lipid and for you know, ceramides. And then you see how, the, how big distribution is, is uh, all over the film. And many labs are simply failed to, to get into the, the desired sort of quality range. Some is missing here and, and, and so on. So basically, we have full concordance of our species. And you know, of course, when we have exactly the same internal standard, it will be a golden sort of golden dream for uh, for lipidomic analysis. If if and when we have a, you know, each inter internal standard for each species, our concordance is just high. All right. So now, what we have learned from doing the lipidom, I mean the uh, plasma lipidom so far, we can quantify lipids in moles clearly, right? We are concordant with classical clinical chemistry. We are concordant between labs and the, the workflow we developed is matching the demand. So if you, you know, just let me show now application example for that. It's also important for, for, for the tissues that we'll be talking about just uh, recently. So we took plasma lipid from the healthy subjects. Because I mean, as I said, uh, we, we, we don't really have a baseline. We have to determine this. And for example, although uh, you know, even uh, quite some years ago, um, there was a big an open question: How reproducible is the lipidome of the healthy individuals? As it's variable, right? I mean, can can we just compare people to people? We only can compare trends. Are concentrations reproducible? So if you if you only consider, you know, let's say subject, there's no serious health conditions, right? So it turns out that it is reproducible. It's extremely reproducible. So, however, there, there is a remarkable difference, reproducible and measurable between males and females. So, if you if you talk to somebody and say, okay, so we have a mixed cohort, and then we we sort of use statistical adjustment to, to kind of to, to nullify or reduce those differences, it's probably not the wise approach, right? There's a difference between males and females, and then the base level, as you see here. Here you've got the uh, lipid classes which you quantified and the number of species. It's also published, as you see, and there's some trends. But those differences are becoming remarkably, oh God, uh, remarkably um, enhanced by medication. And by the so-called you know, seemingly I mean, life quality medication, like uh, hormonal contraception. If you compare, let's say, females taking the hormonal contra contraception and not taking, and they're all on the same mole as the same age, 25, 35, uh, and all healthy. You, know, you see that the difference is big and remarkable, and it's even bigger than the difference between the, let's say, females with healthy conditions and without healthy conditions. Why we can see this? Just because we quantify it in moles, we, we, we can set up the baseline, 
and, and uh, we can compare um, the lipidomes accurately. So we, we go for concentrations rather than we go going for the trends. Okay, so I mean, just to, uh, to, to, to wrap this up, we discover lipid signatures relevant to physiology. I was a guy, I was, was a good example between like males and females and, and uh, uh, hormone interference with, with the drug. So, I mean, you see that the differences, in fact, that in the previous diagram are sizable in magnitude. So we don't really have like one million fold difference or hundred thousand mole difference. When we talk lipidomes, the differences are small, right? So I mean, we can argue how small, how big they are, but I mean, they are, we don't go for like a, like the normal in proteomics, like 10 fold, 100 fold. Not, not really, right? I mean, the, the differences always span through multiple lipid classes and species. Indeed, the, the lipidome is promiscuous, right? As, as I said, it's like an, an European Union, it's a negotiation thing, right? So, I mean, so the, the, uh, if, if there is a, the, there's a shift in physiology of state, it spans through multiple lipid classes, and of course, through the multiple lipid species. But the good idea, a good, good, good message is we can look at the reference values, and those differences are reflected by the reference values, and they could be associated with the health status, gender, ethnicity, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, all together, we're in a very good shape to start looking for tissues. I mean, this long introduction, in a sense, was it has only one purpose. Because when the blood plasma is sort of a standardized, there are probably you know, 100 years of, uh, of medical history of studying the, the blood plasma and kind of in, on, the, on, on the blood itself, right? In all possible and impossible ways. So before we are certain that we can talk to liquid biopsy, we can take the, the blood, you know, let's say blood plasma, we could not go for tissues. So the previous message was to convince you that we are good enough to do blood to go for a little bit more complex than tissue. Why do we want tissues? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the blood doesn't really have lipid synthesis. Well, I can sort of argue how much of the synthesis occurs in blood or if any, but it's not massive. Would you agree with this, right? So, I mean, the disease and the metabolic disease is not developed in blood. It's reflected in blood, but it's not developed in blood. If we are go to the cause of disease, we have to go where the, the, the disease occurs, right? We have to go to brain, we have to go to liver, we have to go to kidney, something, right? But not blood. If we go for the causes, but not consequences. I mean, as involved, the, as I said, lipidome is a compromised entity. So, I mean, the, the organs, they, acquire, they, they reflect specialized biochemistry, physiology, histology, right? That's what makes the organism. Each, if we, each, each organ is special. Can we sense the speciality by lipidomics? And then, of course, uh, if we, we, we can sort of, uh, reasonably well analyzed blood, then we are confident we could go to tissues and still do it in a standardized way because at least the blood we can congo. So we, we tried to, uh, to, to pursue the, the tissue lipidomics by collaborating with Johan Hampes lab in here in Dresden and analyzing the biopsies from the patients from the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFOL. What is NAFOLD? Well, I mean, imagine that we have a, somebody, an individual, who is just normal. It's normal body weight, it's not obese, and normal liver. It doesn't drink much alcohol, healthy style, all cool. But then in the meantime, because of social reasons or disease reasons or genetics, I mean, the obesity progresses. It hits the person. The person becomes obese in different st sort of state, but the, the, the liver is still healthy. Yeah, okay, it's got kind of start, uh, uh, showing the early signs of the accumulation of uh, increased lipid droplets and in some slightly changed metabolism, but it's still healthy. Then in the meantime, <clears throat> at some point, something happens. The, uh, the massive and large and sizable accumulation of lipid droplets of fat, the physiology changes in some sort of a fibers you know, appears still not threatening, still mild, but they are seen in histology. If it goes, uh, goes further, so uh, that is okay. I'm sorry, I mean, the stage was called NEFL, non alcoholic fatty liver, right? So, non alcoholic fatty liver disease is a disease, NEFL, and non alcoholic fatty liver is a liver state. So, and then it progresses to non alcoholic steatohepatitis. So, that's sterile hepatitis caused not by the virus, not by something, but by the accumulation of fat, by the epitope metabolism. So, I mean, the, the liver is becoming fibrotic, 
there's inflammation, sizable inflammation occurs in there, uh, the histology changes, liver malfunctions. And then eventually it can go to cirrhosis, cancer, and death. So the multiple stages. You see, I mean, it, it's a kind of a gold mine. I'm sorry for being so cynical for a lipidomic scientists because we have like the same liver, a cohort of patients, they are well diagnosed, the biopsy is available, and, and it's still the same tissue. I mean, let's see if the, uh, and it's, it's clearly, it's a fat disease, right? It's lipid disease, lipid accumulates. So what are lipidome changes? And how are lipidome changes? If and how are lipidome changes are associated with the disease state? Well, we analyze about a large cohort of patients. I mean, the, the cohort has been assembled in over many years, uh, 365 patients. They were classified in four groups, as I said, the normal controls, which is normal, normal, healthy obese, the people who are obese, but whose liver is to a kind of occasion, you know, nephil, no alcoholic fatty liver, still a kind of the perturbed liver and NASH with hepatitis. So, I mean, we, we've been very conserved uh, in terms of the selecting lipid species and in, in the thresholds and reproducibility and repeatability uh, of the same species within the cohort. So basically we could detect, uh, uh, you know, 400, uh, over 400 species, 450, but I mean, by this conserved, I always keep this for clarity. We only keep about 300 lipid species reproducibly and consistently detected throughout the cohorts. So the good, okay, so the kind of a bad news in a sense, right? 300 by today's standard, 300, you know, it may be not that much, right? You know, but the good news is that they cover all kinds of essential lipids. The glycerol phospholipids, I'm making the biological membranes, finger lipids, yes. However, also blood serolipids, lipids, DAX, DAX, cholesterol versus cholesterol. So here's the diagram. I mean, you'll see, okay, so there's a log scale. So be, be, be careful in here. What you see is that or else indeed, when the fatty liver progresses and the, let's say the red is an ash and the blue is the normal control, indeed we accumulate more fat, right? More triacylglycerols over here. In the uh, cholesterol losses, triacylglycerols and diacylglycerols. Oh, good. So, I mean, the bad news are uh, that the nothing else change, or at least no, nothing else changes within the, the magnitude, which is comparable with the biological range. Okay, so I mean, the, that's true. And in fact, if you just submitted them, the, the, the data set to, uh, to, to PC plot, and you see there's some separation between nephil, nash, and whatever, but also if we uh, remove the neutral lipids, uh, the separation disappears, no big change. Again, I mean, we thought this like maybe nephil is about like accumulating some special type of fat, right? So, I mean, you have uh, one type of fat, one, uh, one composition of triacylglycerols at the beginning, but then when the uh, lipid droplets are becoming big, I mean, that requires different fat. No, it's exactly the same fat, both on the diacylglycerol level, it's just the upper, upper um, row, and the triacylglycerol level is the lower row, both in terms of the chain length and the number of double balls. It's exactly the same. So the same fat, which is closely similar to, to white adipose fat is accumulating in the liver, no difference. So we start looking to, uh, for, for the classifiers. And then of course, it's very obvious that, I mean, the clinical markers didn't really help in this case, because the clinical markers, they come in later when the liver is significantly perturbed. And then we, um, but then, of course, if we look for, for the lipidomics markers, and lipidomics markers is the triacylglycerols and diacylglycerols, mostly saturated uh, triacylglycerols. And of course, it makes you a great separation, fantastic classifiers, but it's completely not interesting, right? We kind of know that the, um, the, the lipid, uh, lip, uh, liver accumulates fat anyway. Why bother? What's interesting is that in this whole row, please just let's just take it, take a careful thing. Yes, you don't see any membrane lipid. No, no, no glycerol phospholipids. Nothing, no, no cholesterol. Nothing really here remarkable. So basically, it looks like the, the, the membrane lipid stays almost the same or the same, right? And apart from two things, it's very odd. Finger myelins, they are odd chain, and one of them is highly unsaturated. All right, I mean, the three double bonds. So um, in, in all together in the whole molecule. 
So we uh, calibrate at this point, we start calibrating with uh, the lab of Josh Powering in here, and then and the student from Josh and Team Rosette did this beautiful work. I, I took I, I took liberty to use his slides directly. It's also on the web on, on, a, on our um, uh, YouTube channel. You can have a look on this as a beautiful informatic work from these people. Without them, we'll go stuck with the bar diagrams, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't go very far. So we have plotted finger magnets, all finger magnets, and whatever is blue is a kind of an healthy uh, subject, and what is red over here is in the um, in the in the steatoric uh, steatoric patients, and you see that there is a dynamics, a certain dynamics of finger magnets, which is different. Whereas most of the finger magnets exactly the same. This highly unsaturated finger magnets, which are very odd molecules, and we confirm those molecules are real. By MSMS and whatever, it it, it looks uh, it, it makes a different change. So one uh, one single minus thirty four zero is obesity marker. So that's why kind of it still behaves health in the in the healthy uh, increase in the healthy um, collection of patients just because they have healthy obese. So we focus on those on the single minus which are having a higher saturation. Three double bonds, four double bonds, unheard of, right? In the um, in the old number of carbons altogether in the, in the single single zinc backbone. So, um, what 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 was bad about this classification is that it works uh, as as good as the triacylglycerols between uh, classifying between the healthy bees and let's say Nash, but it sort of was compromised uh, between um, let's say. Nephil, healthy bees, and Nash in a different way. So I mean the um, the team from uh, Josh they developed what's called the big clustering method. They are on their own. So they start looking in the sub cohorts. I mean the cohorts connected uh, in the cohorts of patients which are enriched either in Nephil and Nash or in, in healthy bees in here. So in fact, to make the story very short. We kind of understood that in the tissue, the nephil as such is not really a scientific merit. And it's, it's not biochemical merit. There are subgroups of nephil. This intermediate group contains the nephil, like healthy bees, and these are H nephil. And the nephil, which are like sick nephil, still nephil, still by the histological classification, they are not really developed to Nash, but very similar to Nash, kind of a borderline, in some way intermediate case, right? So that's where disease actually started. That's where disease becomes irreversible. And then we look at the at the um, the median ratios of those finger lipids, finger myelins over, over here. And we use this uh, finger myelin CT22 because it hasn't been changed with a normalization factor. We see there is a kind of a tipping point, which occurs somewhere in the uh, between the uh, well H nephil or healthy nephil and the intermediate nephil. You know where the the ratio of this of the of the finger melon is changing and is becoming reversible. So I mean I'm I'm not seeing that, that the uh, nephil to Nash transition occurs because of the finger melons. They're very minor, in fact, and then of course the lipidome you know, remains more, almost the same, right? But it's a sign of it, and in the sign this transition in tissue. Is not going through this sort of a gradual and sort of a smooth increase of, of the fat, but the biochemistry changes at some point abruptly. And hopefully, what we what we found is the marker of this change. So we don't really think it's a diagnostic marker. Obviously, you don't want to do the biopsy for the diagnosis, but it's a sign of a bit of biochemistry, and we want to pursue this further. So uh, that's a, that's kind of a very tissue specific in that sense. So, I mean, what talking to Nephil, the first conclusions. Yes, the fat accumulates, but it's not interesting fat. It's not diagnostic fat. The amount is diagnostic, but it's trivial. The bulk of what's, what's interesting is that the bulk of lipidome is not changing. Not at least, you know, at the, when the liver stays the liver, it's not like melts and, you know, during cirrhosis or something like this, right? I mean, there's still kind of the, the, the organism tries to maintain the biological identity of the hepatocytes. So, I mean, the changes, if any, are confined to uh, lipid subgroups. So, in, in, in the, uh, there's a fixed point transition instead of steady accumulation, the tipping point, let's call it this way. And that we, I'll try to show you a bit further. That's 
the sort of this conservation of the lipid composition, where again, I mean, compared to plasma, there's no sort of a continuous change in a continuum of, of lipid composition, but rather, you know, the organism making the effort to maintain the composition till, till the very end is a very typical for, for, for almost any tissue or whatever to all tissues which we saw so far. That makes us conclude that the omics should be spatial specific. And at the same time, omics should be comprehensive. I mean, lipidomics at least, right? So the imaging can, can be extremely spatial specific, but it lacks the coverage. Because even here, this, this uh, rather naive analysis, we're talking about hundreds of lipid uh, lipids and, and, and 20, 22, whatever, 20, up to 25 lipid classes, right? That's what we need, right? That's because that's what I, I've been explaining to you before. We need this breadth and coverage because lipidome is a compromised thing, right? So, and at the same time, we have to be specific. We have to be specific for, you know, for, for, uh, for finding the, the causes rather than consequences and markers. So it means that we have to be able to analyze, to isolate and analyze the full, the full lipidome of the histological identical tissues. So we do it by the laser capture mapping section. The way how the technology works, there are many, many ways to, to, to do this, is that you take the, um, the same tissue, you uh, isolate, you kind of mark the histological feature, kind of which is visual, visualized by staining, and then you use the uh, laser capture to cut it and cut up. So basically you collect exactly those species. So the beauty is that, that uh, we can do precise collection in here. We can collect the, the catapulted material into the cap, right? We can make pre rather precise collection because we, we see exactly what we are cutting. Out. I mean, there's, a, there's not that trivial, but uh, I'll probably skip it for, for, for now. It's doable. But, uh, so I mean, the, the big beauty is that if you have similar features on the same cry section, you can collect them together. In this way, you can combine more and more and more material, so you gain coverage. Where say, let's say imaging will image each pixel individually in re, and, 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 and get the spectrum. We, uh, we make a hypothesis that this histological feature is the same in, in whatever uh, whatever's part of the slice, and we can get them, we can collect them, and we can analyze them in one go. From a sizable amount of material, we reach this sizable coverage. So it's suitable for very somics applications. And uh, um, yes, it's the, the, the number of, of uh, omics papers, not only like uh, transcriptomics, but let's say proteomics and, and metabolomics and lipidomics, um, coupled, you know, with the uh, or relying upon the um, the, the, the market dissection is actually increasing. In, in many organs and many um, concept, um, bi biological contexts. So one of the examples which we used, we analyzed the liver, again, the, the liver slices, and then the liver is structured, and there are two, two, two very distinct uh, species, uh, distinct areas that, that we, we can see, the so-called the, uh, the, the peripotal and pericentral areas. They, very different, they differ very strongly in metabolism, and we can visualize them by staining and we can analyze them separately. In a sense, that's not a big biological discovery, but it's a really good method to, to actually to establish the bona fide of the technique which we use. So basically, we used three cry sections successive. So we stained uh, the, um, the, the intermediate um, in the section by antibodies, by some staining. We take the image and then transfer it to the uh, to the images of other other slices, and then to uh, then use it for for collection. So because we uh, for lipidomics we cannot use the stain image like we did with transcriptomics. So that's why there's a, a bit more elaborate technology, but again, it's kind of doable. So I mean, we also have to have to use a different technique because the, uh, the to do this because the amount of material is small or smaller because the chemical noise is higher. And that's why uh, instead of like FDMS, direct FDMS measurements, we use the so-called TC. So in a sense, what we do, we, we acquire spectra in small mass ranges, you know, to enhance the, the signal intensity and uh, um, prevent, you know, massive impact of the incalescence in the or orbit traps, if it tells you something, you know, and then we, we actually, for interpretation, we stitch them together 
in, and we use one sort of a artificially produced spectrum out of many bits and pieces uh, collected through the TC. Again, it uh, just takes more time, but it's a known technique, it's a software, and, and uh, it's doable and it's applicable and it's robust. So we can, uh, we can, we of course, they verify the, the technique. So we could take, for example, uh, like, like blood, uh, plasma. We can dry this plasma on a certain surface and use the micro dissection to collect this material and actually compare the lipid composition from the processed plasma and cut plasmas, right? And then we, since we quantify uh, each and every lipid species and molds, we can use more percentages, all right? So basically we analyze the, uh, the, the plasma extra. And at the same time, we cut the certain pieces of, of, of the dried plasma. It's like we use like a, a kind of glass-like mass, right? Analyzes, and we compare them all the percentages. And you see that in fact, with very few exceptions, very, and on a very mild scale, it's actually pretty concordant, if not to say identical. So this is linear, so we are commutative. And we, this concordance, we see both on the level of the lipid class species, uh, lipid class species, yes, exactly, uh, lipid classes, and both on the molecular species, like here is the PC and, and um, um, cholesterol acids. Just an example, right? So our, as, our analysis is as good or as bad as a classical analysis of the total extract, which is good news. So, I mean, when we, when we go for um, uh, something more lipid, uh, let's say the, the histologically specific um, areas. So like we, we visualize the periportal area in here and cut this separately. And also the pericentral area and cut this separately is visualized by the glutamine synthetase staining. We can have we can have a, a western blot to make sure that the separate the, the isolation is correct. So the glutamine synthetase is only in pericentral zone but not in periportal and albumin is everywhere as a, as a loading control. So isolation is specific. We can do uh, we can do also proteomics analysis because we collect the protein uh, we we extract lipids but we collect the pellet which is left after the, the extraction we can subject it to, to sort of a semi quantitative if not quantitative lipidomics uh, proteomics analysis and indeed I mean look for the markers and indeed many markers are known same um, and, and uh, we also discovered some known markers exclusively present in let's say periportal and, and uh, or exclusively pre present in pericentral so it's confirms that it actually works. So interestingly, in a, in a sense, disappointingly, we saw that although metabolically, the periportal and pericentral zones are very different, lipid dome is pretty much the same, at least on the lipid class species. Well, I mean, there's something, it kind of fits to, to what we, we, we saw in the, in, in the liver before. So we'll look at the uh, lipid class composition, the same yet, yeah, and the lipid species composition. And we saw some difference on the level of the lipid species. And then, in fact, they are rather small. So altogether, between the metabolically very distinct periportal and pericentral zones with distinct proteomics composition, we talk about the 13 species whose abundance is, is uh, changing by less than a quarter, 25%. Once again, see? I mean, the lipidome is very conserved. It's kind of promiscuous by the idea, by the design, but it's very conserved. That's what, what it takes to analyze the lipidome tissues. It was an interesting project when we analyzed the uh, biopsies from colorectal cancer from, uh, from, from a number of patients. And then indeed, we see here was the, um, that the compositions are also pretty stable. We can identify certain variations of species, right? We can mark them. But altogether, the composition of the colon cancer biopsy and the normal causa, just taken a few centimeters, well, 10 to 20 centimeters actually, you know, apart from the, from the area, which is also clean histologically, are not much different. There are some differences, however. So uh, we, again, we start seeing the differences in the ceramide and sphingomyelin profiles. Small, less than a quarter, you know, but statistically significant. And we are now trying to understand what does it mean, you know, what those differences mean. But for me, as, a, as an analytical chemist, this conservation, this independence of the lipidome from the disease state is striking. 
we can, you know, of course, you can question. Well, look, uh, we all look for big changes. How comes that you don't see those changes? And it's only maybe you. Maybe it's a you know matter of the technology or the lab. Interestingly, that completely independent from us, from completely independent cohort. Uh, I mean, the Jakob um, Liebisch lab in Regensburg analyzes uh, the, the the colon biopsies. Right, so they, they have like three cohorts, you know, um, two, two cohorts in, in, in independently from us, and they also used our third cohort as an independent comparison and validation. You see, it's over here. So, um, remarkably, the concordance between the Dresden results and the Regensburg result is extremely high. So, I mean, this also was a shotgun method. Once again, everything was different technically, yet the concordance is there. And uh, uh, it's only a few species, which also observed for us, by us, but we didn't use it for classification because of the small number of samples. Um, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the marker lipids are limited by just only a few. So the ceramides, some single myelins used use, use for, for, for the classification and the Regensburg data also uh, two specific tags. So once again, uh, yes, it's like a, uh, the marker statistic shows it's a marker, yes, but all overall conservation is remarkable and it's very confirmed by independent comparison between studies, not only by, by labs, but also by studies, by the way how the biopsies were isolated, processed, and analyzed. So, um, sorry about this. So we, we continued with the, um, the tumor and the samples and uh, we, we, know, uh, we start like systematically applying the micro dissection in, uh, and to analyze different pieces of, um, pieces of, of, of uh, different layers basically of, of growing tumors instead of the full biopsy. And here we start seeing the differences and the differences were pretty big and massive. So once again, if we had to analyze the, the main message of this, this talk, if we had to analyze tissues compared to blood plasma, we have to consider the heterogeneity of the tissue. We have to consider heterogeneity on a sort of a micro level, a micrometer level, or maybe even more. And we also have to look for the full lipid profile. For example, let's let's have a look here in, in, in ceramides, you know, lyse lipids. Yeah, okay, could be compromised, whatever. But let's look at the ceramides on, on the picture. And you see that the molar profile of the ceramides is different between the normal epithelia and between the tumor epithelia, and it's kind of changes on, uh, on the way how the tumor progresses. So now we are, we are trying to, to understand what does this all mean. I mean, you see what we see, we, we have, a, we have a, a pretty massive changes in lysolipids, lipids, LPs, LPIs, uh, on the ceramides, on the hexazeal ceramides. And also, I skip this for clarity on the level of individual molecular species. Conclusions and speculations. Once again, tissues in contrast to plasma, somehow, organism strive to maintain its compositional identity. Right. So, I mean, the, the, although, I mean, the, the, the histo histological, you see that tissues, tissues is quite kind of compromised. Right? The cancer, for example, is developing. You know, still the lipid composition, the metabolism, lipid metabolism, the basis of metabolism seems to be conserved, right? Differences there, they are confined to some specific lipid classes. And that's what makes them interesting. But if you, if you hope that they do a sort of a biomarker and analysis of, of, of the tissues and you see the massive change, which will be super diagnostics and then you can do it in, in, in 15 minutes, that I know maybe not the case for the tissues. As I said, changes are not global. Yes, they, and then in, uh, it can be kind of quite high, in fact, but compared to the interpatient variations, they are modest. So the um, so far, what we've seen is the, the change, the interesting change, is somehow associated to the uh, ceramides finger myelin excess. Maybe as a matter of technology, maybe we can uh, find something more. Maybe um, it's kind of our preference bias, but it's interesting that in how many instances, and I'm, I, I've been only talking about a few examples in here, right? Uh, that we, we did many more. Um, it's always somehow ceramide and gamalinex is involved. 
And the difference again is not really like serum, serum, ceramides up, syngomalins are down, or syngomalins are down, ceramides up, you know, but it's a redistribution of molecular species. And it's not really that kind of replicas of the, of the abundance. And what's, uh, what's interesting, what's intriguing and remains to, to, to be studied, and I think it's, there's uh, much more to do you know, for, for the whole field, not, not like for the modest lab as we are, is that it looks like in tissues, we start seeing the tipping points, like at, uh, where, where, where at some stage of disease, the marker is changing by the switch and then remains the same or, or, or it's not changing that, that significantly. So the kind of is, if you wish, uh, phase transition, may I say so, you know, in a lipid metabolism where sort of meta metabolism decides that, you know, we progress to disease and, and the way we, we stop uh, sort of fighting, um, you know, we stop trying to get the metabolism back to normal. But again, you know, whatever I'm talking about is not massive. They're mild, milder, smaller changes, which are confined to certain specific markers. My lab. I mean, this is like the old photo, pre-COVID time, but this all people who, who, who really you know, contributed to, to, to this project. And uh, we, you know, I, I want to keep the old photo um, just to acknowledge them. You know, many of this, um, they left, they are, take, they are taking jobs in industry, in academia, you know, but that's what, uh, what the team was, you know, and, and, and uh, without these talented people, I, we would have, it would be not possible to do it in here with this very complex and very sort of undefined, very sort of promiscuous area as the tissue lipidome. My names, um, my sort of big, uh, biggest uh, gratitude to Oscar, to Olga, to Eugene, and also Suzanne Sainz, who, who left you know, long, long, long ago, um, that whose work I presented here. So uh, uh, strategic collaborations and, and uh, uh, Josh Pauling's lab, is who did all the informatics and very innovative methods for, for those in, in the, his very talented student team, Rosa. Um, <clears throat> collaboration with the clinics, Jochen Hampe, Sebastian Seisek, who provided the clinical oversight and material in the University of Graz, in you know, Harald Koeffler's lab. I'm here only keeping PIs for, for clarity, um, who, who, who helped us with the in-depth analysis of the molecular species of uh, syngomalis. Uh, that that would be discovered in the liver project. Very great technology and great help. And of course, you can get all the details in, in the um, more information on the, our web page. If you look for Twitter, we used to kind of to tweet whatever's interesting is going on in here. And also we set up a, like a YouTube um, called channel or whatever. So we have put collections of, uh, of the, the videos, which are explaining the recently published papers in some kind of a more humanistic style you may enjoy in the video instead of my long and you know talk.